welcome to our participants and to our speakers and moderator um, session six contemporary ways of collecting as part of the Comcall 2020 annual conference online um, so we already started this morning with some interesting um, examples from Taiwan and we will move on now on the topic of contemporary ways of collecting. I would like to give the floor to our moderator of today, um, Olga Sinitsina, advisory board member of the Mikhail Prokhorov Foundation. I'm very, help, um, I'm very happy to have you here and I would like to give the floor to you. Thank you. Can I turn on? Hello, everybody, and thank you very much, uh, Daniela, for giving me the floor. And I'm really honored to moderate and to, 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 to lead this session. Um, I'm very well attached to ICOM. I am the national representative for SICA uh, section of educational programs. So, and, and collecting is very close to what the educationists are doing. And I've attended already two sessions uh, yesterday and uh, the hot topics which are discussed at these sessions are really incredible. And we are going to continue and to talk about uh, how to deal with hard uh, topics in history and how to collect the museum objects and how to form to make museum collections in contemporary way, in inclusive way and sharing and collecting in this sense come very very close together so and i'm really um, uh, happy to to greet all our speakers and to address to those who are behind the screen who are attending this uh, session welcoming you to write your questions and answers um, pushing the special button and in the end we'll have about 30 minutes i guess to have this questions and answers session and I will do my best to forward all your questions to the speakers. So please welcome our first speaker, Joanna Kroll, who is head of digital collections um, from the Museum Polin um, in, in Warsaw, Poland, Museum of the History of Polish Jews. And her presentation was made by two distinguished uh, professionals from this museum and she will talk more about her colleague. Please, Joanna. Hello, hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me just share the presentation, which is a kind of, um, uh, I'm sorry, how to do it, how to do it. Um, yeah, share screen now. Good. Yeah, can you see it? Yes. Could you please Great. full screen? Yep. Yeah, I put it in a full screen, so now it should be now it should be fine. Sorry, always this technical issue is making me a bit stressed. So my presentation was supposed to be together with my dear friend Aldona Modrzewska, but she's absent. She's actually the head of the uh, collection department at Pauline Museum. Um, anyway. Uh, I am, I am the head of the Digital Collections and the Resource Center, and I work at Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw since 2010. So it's 10 years. Uh, and because of that, I guess I have a right to talk about the collection as it is, because uh, I was a witness on how it developed and how we somehow try to, to reshape our collection. Um, so, um, uh, I, uh, in this presentation, me and Aldona, uh, the um, collection uh, department head, wanted to focus on a dialogue with donors, because donors are the most, uh, or at some stage of development of our institution, were the most important part of our collection building. Uh, who, uh, let me just in, give you some uh, introduction about our museum. It was built in the former uh, Warsaw Ghetto area and before the war, the Jewish quarter of Warsaw. After the war, this is what left uh, because, um, because of the German occupation in Poland and the uprising of the Jewish people in 1943, uh, the, 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 the city was severely d demolished, as you can uh, see. And our building, our museum was exactly located here, designed by a Finnish architect, Rainer Malamaki, opened in 2013. Um, 
uh, I almost nothing left, as you can see. Or let's say what left is this, what you see on the picture taken by the Canadian photographer Henry and Cobb uh, just after the war in 1947. Um, and uh, we started uh, uh, we started our museum in 2005, but the idea somehow um, developed at the beginning of 90s, uh, obviously with the with the fall of communism regime in Poland. So here we are in 2000, um, 2014. We are opening our core exhibition, and uh, the initiators of our museum wanted this uh, museum to be a kind of multimedia uh, super museum which uh, would host thousands of guests and uh, would uh, prepare interactive installations for the visitors. Um, not, not, it wasn't that obvious at that time, uh, so in 90s, 2005, th that we will have a collection that collection will, will be something uh, crucial and important because the most uh, important was the exhibition, which was designed to be this kind of almost like a multimedia performance, as you can see, based on the archival materials we were able to collect almost from all over the world. So um, uh, at some point, of course, we had, to, we, we had to follow what the visitors also say and what they expect from us. And uh, um, uh, here we come to this turn in the museology. Um, uh, so 90s uh, kind of performance, multimedia performance. And then 2000, started, we started thinking of, of uh, building a collection. Also because of some practical issues, I will speak about them later on. So at this time, we decided to work with donors people who, uh, who, will, uh, uh, who will eager to trace last Jewish traces uh, in, in, in Poland. And uh, we decided to, uh, to promote the idea that we are open to our donors. We ask them to share their, uh, the objects and the stories with us. And uh, eventually out of it in 2013, uh, one of our first temporary exhibitions actually was focused on donors and what they have donated. Uh, so here is the opening of uh, one of our exhibitions at that time before the core exhibition, by the way, because it was at October 2014. So this is a year before. And um, uh, I decided to, to, to pick up some of the photos from the uh, opening of this temporary exhibition, which was entitled Biographies of Things. And uh, we wanted to present our visitors before we were like widely open to everyone uh, all around the world that we have actually a collection and these are really interesting objects for instance like the chess uh, that were uh, uh, um, made in hiding by a, a Jewish couple and uh, uh, a lot of archival materials diaries memoirs um, obviously, we started recording our donors uh, because we and we find find out that what they want to tell us and what is the motive of their donation is equally almost important to actually the symbolic dimension of the object they donate. So um, uh, a few few campaigns of of such. Uh, um, like calls to people to to to, to give and donate. Uh, eventually succeed that we have almost uh, over 300 um, objects in our collection and most of them are archival uh, objects and uh, at some point uh, at some point uh, uh, um, well from from the beginning we knew these are some some of the objects are really personal for instance this is a uh, this is a attic calendar of a, of a woman who was in hiding in Wusk, now in Ukraine, and it is presented in a, a, a hiding on the Aryan side uh, gallery of our uh, of our um, uh, core exhibition. This is a, 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 a girl a dress donated by Anna Tachtenherz, who was March 68 emigrant, a Jewish emigrant from Poland from 60s, uh, who left because of the anti-Semitic campaign prepared by the communist regime at that time. Uh, these, some of the objects were um, 
uh, where, where, where things made out of, uh, uh, well, well the, these are the objects that were desecrated. So for instance, this is a, a Torah scroll and it serves as a kind of a drum, as you can see. And uh, uh, at the same time, our museum uh, started uh, developing uh, digital projects, which are also about collection and also, also about, about collecting uh, things. And one of the most important was the Virtualstadt uh, website, uh, which was collecting articles about Jewish uh, cities, Jewish towns in, uh, in historical borderlines of Poland, um, photos of the synagogues, uh, information about uh, people, uh, uh, Polish people, for instance, of Jewish, Jewish origins. Um, but at that time, I think it's like 2000, uh, 2000, uh, 2009, the virtual state was born. And then we continue 2014, as I said, the core exhibition was, was opened to the public. Uh, we were still a young institution, which, uh, which was shaping itself. And this growing up took us some time. <clears throat> and at some point, as I mentioned, we, 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 we gathered a lot of different objects from our donors. Um, uh, uh, at some point, we started uh, thinking, okay, something has to be done with our collection because uh, uh, also, also because this, uh, this idea of, of, of donors and this enthusiastic accepting almost every uh, object this, uh, somehow started to be more and more problematic for those who take care of the collection. Uh, we started thinking we can't collect exactly everything and uh, we started thinking, all right, we are open. The car exhibition is impressive. Millions of people came to visit. Well, millions, at least over one million since its uh, opening. And uh, what are the next steps and what are our ambitions as a Jewish museum in Poland and in Europe in uh, general? And here again, the, 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 the Stadt and the digital projects uh, came up somehow with the answer because uh, apart from presenting uh, in, uh, in, in, on digital, uh, in this digital world, uh, beautiful photos of the synagogues or former death camps. This is Jablinka death camp, 70 kilometers from Warsaw to its direction, a Jewish quarter in Krakow. We also got this, for instance. Uh, it's, a, it's a picture, uh, I'm, I'm making fun of our own projects, it's a picture uh, and, uh, donated again by a visitor of the virtual Stadt, and the person uh, just was interested in, let's say, material culture of the city of uh, city Biały Bur and entitled the photo the synagogue, which obviously doesn't, the sculpture, the wooden sculpture you see doesn't uh, resemble a synagogue at all. And we just realized we can't go on this way. We have 80,000 items and some of them were really beautiful, like this. And some of them were completely out of order and collection, like the infamous sculpture. And uh, what I wanted to tell you is that how to prepare the strategy of collecting and dialogue with donors and the criteria of the collection for the future, some of the ideas how to do it came from the digital world. Because the digital world give us an opportunity to document almost everything with your phone and post it to Facebook or other media all the time, whenever you are. And as you know, it's a one big rubbish uh, sometimes. Uh, so um, uh, through this uh, understanding of the quality and quantity issues of the digital world, we decided to set some of the uh, criteria and standard of our own collection and how to collect, uh, how, to, how to dialogue with our donors. So um, uh, we set uh, uh, a group of uh, a criteria and one of them we called a moderation uh, another uh, a quality which we understand more as a reliability so for instance if somebody gives us a cup of tea claiming that this is a post jewish or ex jewish or it used to belong to jewish people but exactly doesn't know the the the, the history of this object we say no we say thank you um, 
if uh, somebody gave us a chess that his uh, parents used to uh, play in the in the hiding and then continues to give us some other personal belonging we have a right now to say no and obviously sometimes it's difficult to say no because our donors are emotionally attached to our institution but thanks to use of the standard and the criteria it's easier to explain so for instance um, the person who donated the chess uh, was uh, also a pharmacist uh, just after the war. And uh, the fact that was a pharmacist uh, of Jewish origin made us to accept some of the objects from the pharmacy uh, in which he used to work just after the war. Why? Well, because it is somehow also connected with the personal story of this person uh, who was a Jew in hiding, but at the same time uh, was a pharmacist and could be a pharmacist because couldn't be a doctor because of the numerous clauses and anti-Semitism in Poland before the war. So in order to make it a story complete, we decided to accept the objects which were related to his uh, place of work and his, uh, the fact he was a pharmacist, but not necessarily objects which were connecting with collecting stamps or being a scout. And um, uh, uh some 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 these are, these are the examples I, I just wanted to show you briefly um another another issue obviously is about the uh quantity uh, uh this woman tonya lechtman uh, was uh, accused of being a spy in a communist regime poland in 40s and 50s and while she was in the in the, in a um uh, in a prison, she was preparing this uh, knitted kind of small tablecloths day by day, five years. We got 30 of them and we decided eventually to accept all of them uh, because each of this object uh, has this difficult history behind. And it was obviously a, a ethical issue, not only a quality or um, quantity issue uh, to discuss uh, between our curators. Um, but eventually we, we, we uh, accepted all of them. I am presenting this uh, objects to give probably some kind of hint about this ethical aspect of collecting and being in a dialogue with those who donate these objects, which I hope to, to discuss um, in Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joanna. Thank, and thank you for touching very important uh, questions of ethics and, and criteria of collection, because collecting is always about selection and uh, accepting or not accepting. Thank you very much. And you're welcome, I remind all the listeners, uh, all the participants, that you're welcome to put your questions on the questions and answers uh, part of this uh, presentation. Um, our next speaker will continue this, the, the theme of the Second World War and it will be a presentation about collecting in a minefield and participative collecting on the Second World War and conflicts. Eileen Bears, curator, and Vera de Boek, a curator connection from Museum on the Strom Mass from Antwerpen. Belgium. Sorry for sometimes probably mispronouncing <laughs> very difficult names. Sorry. You're welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And you're doing a good job with the pronunciation. <laughs> um, I will start to share the screen. I hope this is okay. Mm. And um, it's uh, not full screen yet. Uh, not yet. Uh, Could you please make it full screen? If it's F five or full screen yes, sharing um, the screen. Okay. Yeah. That's yes. Okay, I think. Yeah. Perfect. Mm. Um, uh, so this, uh, the presentation of the Poland Museum is really very, in, uh, it's really close to uh, um, a project we are doing now in the MAS. Um, and the Truly Objects project is uh, uh, 
preparation of a new exhibition on um, Antwerp and the Second World War, which will open uh, in 2023. Uh, but um, considering uh, the, the collection we have now, and most of all considering our role as a museum vis-a-vis -vis this complex uh, uh, topic, um, we decided to start um, uh, a collecting project. And um, uh, uh, Vera and I, we just have uh, met a lot of donors last weekend. Uh, so now I will uh, first um, start with a short overview of, in fact, the, the history of this World War II collection, which is part of our larger uh, collection. And then um, Vera will jump to uh, the, the collecting activity itself and we will conclude together and hope you can give us inspiration. So um, we uh, looking at uh, the Moss collection is a big collection of about half a million objects, but um, 700 of these objects have um, a relation with World War II. And if you look at this collection today, it's very much a collection without people, without persons. And uh, this uh, uh, um, is in fact related to the way this war has been remembered since 1945 uh, in our country and in our city. Um, the first five years of, after the war, uh, there was an active collecting and remembrance with focus on armies, liberations and resistance and not on individual victims. And um, an example of this is um, are several weapons in our collection, uh, amongst others two German V bombs, uh, which uh, the, this type of bombs fell on the city uh, with thousands uh, at the end of the war. And uh, these two bombs were given by um, uh, uh, an Amer American general, General Armstrong, and um, so he was then the donor, and uh, that's why these objects are in the collection. And uh, the same goes for flags, for uh, clothes and weapons of resistance members. Uh, it's the same period in which um, the graveyards are constructed and monuments on these graveyards are being installed. But it's not a period of individual uh, remem remembering. And then there is a, a whole period uh, in which we see in our collection quite some acquisitions, but all through passive collecting. So no active collecting uh, of, um, around this topic. Um, the MOS is a new museum. It's only 10 years that it exists, but it's a fusion of different museums. And in these former museums, you see in this period, uh, the 1950s up until the 1990s, that there is no active collecting, but there are objects that have been given. And um, uh, like, for instance, uh, the Star of David in the 1960s, and we do no not know, it's not in the archives, who would have worn it, uh, or if, if it has been worn. Um, a lot of ration stamps, but we do not know from whom. And uh, if you look at this uh, period in uh, Belgian society, this is really a period in which um, uh, there was a lot of silence about the war. And if the war is remembered, this is uh, often very ideological. Um, for instance, um, uh, there was um, this uh, network and communities of, uh, uh, of um, um, collaborators with the Germans, with the Nazi, uh, with the Nazi regime, and um, they very much remember this war uh, and what happened after the war. Um, they remember that uh, they or their family members were punished after the war. That's for this group the major theme. Other groups remember uh, resistance of themselves or the family members. Um, but there is, um, there is a difficulty to share memories uh, at that time. And um, if we talk with uh, people today, they also say in, in families, this uh, was a difficult topic because often families themselves 
members who were divided about this uh, topic. This, so this was not really a time of um, of collective remembering uh, and of uh, um, dealing um, uh, um, in a quiet way, let's say, with this uh, difficult topic. It's uh, uh, a, a lot of decades of unprocessed past. Um, it's a silence. It's not uh, the problem that there are not that the people are not there because a lot of victims of the war are still alive. Uh, but uh, the connection was impossible, let's say. And this started to change um, um, since the mid of the 90s, um, for less in, in Antwerp itself or in, in the collection uh, we have in our museum. But in general, uh, we see that uh, under an influence of the United States and an international influence, uh, the Holocaust and the victims of the Holocaust become much more visible uh, also in our country since the 1990s. Um, there was a, a major exhibition 50 years after the, the end of the war, um, which um, uh, is uh, uh, really a focus on persons, not so much on victims, but it's another perspective. Uh, this, uh, um, I, I was 20 in 1945, uh, and then um, uh, a major uh, step is uh, the opening of the Caserne d'Ossin Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, um, which um, uh, you know, is, is really uh, uh, um, important for the focus on, uh, on victims. And uh, it's also since the 1990s that a lot of victims um, or survivors um, start to speak, and often these people have not done this uh, for for several decades, but they have now this. Uh, since then, they have the um, the um, the opportunity. There is a, a space for this, uh, and uh, this, uh, as I want to say, up until now has not really changed the, the quality of of our collection uh, itself. Um, so I. I give the word to my colleague now, uh, because uh, looking at uh, our collection and, and uh, at the mission of the museum, we very much now want to um, deal in a new way with, uh, with this topic of the war. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure for me to share the uh, project uh, we are um, uh, elaborating right now. It's about active collecting of personal heritage on the Second World War. I continue with what uh, colleague Lean uh, Lee, uh, started. Um, an important question is why, why are we doing uh, this? Um, well, I think there are several different uh, uh, levels. Uh, there is the level of people and there is the level of uh, collection. Uh, maybe first of all, there is uh, always a trigger to start uh, something. In this case, on the Second World War, I must say there was a kind of uh, request, uh, a, a demand uh, coming from um, from uh, the political authorities in Antwerp to do something about this very important period in the Antwerp history, the Second World War. Antwerp was a port, is a port city. The, the, it was the, the supply port for the uh, Allied forces. We have a very diverse city with an important Jewish community during the war um, and now again. Um, so there was a kind of request, but I must say that the Mass Museum rather quickly um, embraced the idea because we saw uh, lots of opportunities um, in this uh, topic uh, in order to uh, realize our ambition as a mass uh, museum uh, because we think it's very important to, um, to, um, to install a collaboration with the uh, city, with the individuals living in it, with the communities living in it. Uh, for us, it's very important to have um, in what we do uh, a co-ownership because uh, this remembrance of, of the war, uh, the objects we have in our collection, initially they come from the people living in Antwerp. So uh, it, it is, it is uh, um, initially already a co-ownership, but 
now there is a kind of distance and we want to reinstall this uh, co-ownership not only as far as the, the the collection or the objects are concerned also about telling the story um, but also uh, installing a, a co-ownership as far as, as as our project is concerned preparing an exhibition so when in 23 we open this exhibition on the war it will be uh, um, uh, an exhibition made by the mass and made by the Antwerp uh, people. So this is our uh, ambition. We want uh, the voice heard, we want a face shown of the people at stake and they, they, they join us in, in, in preparing this project. There is also the level of, uh, of uh, the collection. Uh, Lane already talked about what we have. But it is, it is uh, interesting to, to ask yourself, what do we not have? Or what do we know about our collection? What would we like to know about uh, our collection? And um, it is a reality that uh, other collections in Antwerp and in Belgium uh, also have a war collection. So how do you stand um, uh, towards these collections? So, um, it was a, a, an opportunity to, to reconsider our uh, war collection and to, to see how we can harmonize it with the uh, colleague collections, I will call, I will call it. Um, and it made it clear that for us it is very important to focus on this personal experience, not on the warfare or, or the Jewish uh, persecution, that's not our uh, expertise but our expertise can be the personal experience. How did people live in the city during the war? That's our asset. So in a way you can say that the mass museum um, functions as a hub in society. We connect objects, we connect uh, collections, uh, we connect uh, uh, individuals and communities, uh, we connect uh, past uh, history and uh, present day, or um, uh, must be a little bit humble, we, we will try to connect all these uh, uh, aspects. Uh, yeah, voila. Um, seeing the opportunities and, and having an ambition, that's one thing, but how are you going to realize all this? That's uh, uh, not so uh, easy. Uh, here again, you have uh, several levels. And the first level, which is not very visible, maybe invisible, um, but I think it, it is the, the, the necessary base or the platform on which you are going to build all, all the rest. And I would like to call it a building a joint venture, um, um, investing in, 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 in time, in meeting people, communities, colleague organizations, Therefore, you have to leave the museum. You have to be in the city. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an investment uh, in time, which results in a, a personal network uh, with various partners. I already mentioned this co-ownership. So this is how we try to realize this co-ownership. Um, for the time being only concerning the Second World War, but within time we also will include the present day conflicts because in, the, in, in Antwerp, in the city today, we have lots of people uh, coming uh, from uh, countries uh, where there is a conflict, uh, so they fled their, their home countries because of the war. So we would like to combine these uh, conflicts. Um, so this joint venture, is a necessity in order to uh, overcome or maybe prevent uh, possible um, distrust, uh, individual distrust, uh, social, scientific, and also, of course, political distrust. And if we uh, manage to, to have this network, I think we will be able to, um, to, to, to create more easily um, um, uh, a project, an exhibition, uh, which is co-owned. On the picture you see uh, a war bunker in the city of Antwerp. It is run mostly by volunteer, only by volunteers. And uh, this is an example of, uh, of a collection, an existing collection in Antwerp, uh, which treats the Second World War, which for us is a very, very important partner. Um, they are volunteers, but they have very big, important expertise. We already 
talked, we, we already knew them, of course, but uh, we invited them to join us in our, in our project. They're very enthusiastic. And uh, so this, this, this makes uh, the, 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 in, um, the research and, and the, the development of, of, of projects much more easier if we have their uh, support. That's only one example in the heritage uh, sector. You also see a picture of a school, Yezode Hatora school. It's a Jewish school. Um, um, I already mentioned the important Jewish community. It is a very delicate topic, the war uh, in, in Antwerp in the Jewish community, of course. Um, so they um, are a very important partner for us. And we want uh, to explain what we try to do. We want to uh, show uh, their story, their uh, feelings about it. We, we already, uh, uh, they um, were already partners of the museum for other uh, uh, projects, but for this project um, in particular, it will be a joint venture. And uh, there also we experienced a very enthusiastic uh, reaction um, uh, as far as uh, the preparation of this uh, exhibition in 23 is concerned. Um, last Sunday we had a meeting uh, day with uh, um, Antwerp inhabitants. Uh, Lynn already mentioned the call. That's one of the uh, concrete um, projects we, uh, we want to develop, we are developing. So we have this behind the scenes network and platform uh, support. And then um, as a concrete project, we currently have uh, this call for heritage, uh, war heritage. Um, and I must say that um, the um, colleague heritage collections, the war communities, like for example, the Jewish communities, they already knew about this idea of ours to, to do this call. Um, and they supported it and there was this base. So uh, for them, it was not a surprise to read in the newspaper or to see on television or to see on the website, the mass is going to do a call. In their mind, it is, the mass is doing a call together with us. It's, it's, it's an illustration of what I said earlier. You first have this, this platform, this base, this support in order to make your call successful. And indeed, it is uh, successful. We had, uh, uh, in Corona times, we had to do it uh, in a specific way, but we had several, uh, um, many people uh, responding to our call. You see some of them uh, in the pictures and on top of them, the, 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 the documents and the pictures they bring. We have photographs, uh, documents, poetry and albums, uh, New Year's letters, referring to everything referring to the war of course, and um, um, some of them, the two ladies you see, they, they uh, lived during the, uh, the, the war, uh, so they were very emotional. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the thing you have to deal with uh, also. Um, so it's not only uh, sharing uh, or getting an idea of a, of a collection of a whole, um, these people uh, or these partners in our project will help us in doing the research also. Um, but there is also this uh, participative um, uh, idea in the, the presenting uh, later on and in the remembering as a whole. Here you see um, pictures of a school. Um, uh, we are thinking of um, following the idea of the um, open Yotse house, which was developed in, in Holland. Um, it's an example of uh, leaving your museum building and going into the city and looking for the history uh, and, and what people remember in the city itself, instead of letting the people come to the museum and, and, um, and putting things in a, in a, in a depot. So this is uh, the other way around. Um, it's illustrating how uh, the, 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 the little history um, um, can be um, researched in collaboration with the uh, people concerned. And uh, this particular example is in a school um, where um, lots of Jewish children went to. Um, that most of them did not come back. 
And uh, so it is a very um, emotional, important spot in the city, referring to the war, combining this war history to these students uh, being in the school today makes it possible to, 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 to add a certain uh, level to the importance or the, the meaning of the school building. So it's, um, it's combining history and present day and making um, um, uh, um, a period in history which for these people, for the students, for these uh, young people, it's over, they, they never experience it, but it will make them familiar and will make them um, comprehend what, what, what it meant as, uh, as, uh, as a period in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Antwerp history. Okay. Um, uh, I will uh, talk uh, briefly about uh, several challenges. And um, uh, uh, as you can uh, uh, imagine, um, it's also, of course, uh, this is uh, within a context in which uh, also in the media and in politics there is uh, uh, and the war again receives a lot of attention because it's now uh, 75 years and soon 80 years after the end of the war. That's the whole context why there is an, an, an renewal of, of interest in this. Um, but uh, um, several challenges we meet, of course, is um, uh, the, the tendency uh, of people or organizations or um, also uh, politicians to, to state that one story or object is more important than another, um, that an object would uh, better belong uh, or be part of, uh, uh, not of the mass collection, but of another collection, um, uh, that um, uh, of course a, a big challenge is also that a lot of young people in the city of Antwerp have no relation um, uh, with, uh, with this war. Um, and I have chosen to show you this picture of um, uh, a liberation procession um, in Antwerp, which happens uh, every year, and um, which is a reenactment. And so there is also a community of people in Antwerp, which uh, will tell you how lovely these uniforms of the 1940s. And so um, this is, um, uh, there are uh, several typical objects of this history. Um, there, there, is, uh, there are divided communities and um, the same objects like, uh, let's say a bomb, a flag or uh, a uniform, they might mean uh, a whole, uh, lot of different things to different people. And that's why um, the emotion network strategy of uh, the, the, the Renoir museologist is inspiring for us because we think that uh, later on in the project, we will have to deal with, this, uh, uh, with these different emotions. And at the same time, um, we invest a lot of time in um, talking and creating trust and functioning as a platform for a whole set of uh, views and perspectives uh, um, on this topic um, in order to, uh, to ease the debate and also to connect uh, several communities. That's uh, what we try at least uh, to do. Um, so um, uh, uh, finally, within three years, we will, uh, apart from project in the city, also show an exhibition in our museum. I have a lot of work to do with back office registration. And as the colleague of the Polling Museum said, we will uh, also uh, deal both with the digital objects and um, some, some uh, uh, photos and material objects. But we will have to make a decision about what we really accept as collection and what is uh, um, uh, within the framework of, uh, of a digital registration. And we hope that uh, with this um, uh, open way of working, we can stimulate new ways of dealing with the war in the city and in our museum. Um, and thank you for your questions and comments, which can give us inspiration. Uh, thank you very much, Vera and Lynn. Um, may I 
kindly remind you that we have 15 minutes for presentations and we are a little bit ahead of time at the moment but thank you very much the topic was extremely important and you are doing great job so thank you uh, can i ask those who are listening to please put your questions and answers and we will still have some time in the end to to share these questions and to find the common answers and maybe personal answers and so our next speaker is uh, uh, els ferraferbeke if I'm right in pronouncing <laughs> else your name, and also from, from Ghent, from Belgium, and she will speak about uh, focus on changing rituals, traditions, and habits. Please. Hello. Thank you that I may present here the House of Alain on this uh, inspiring Comcal conference. Um, the House of Alain is uh, the museum of uh, everyday life in Belgium, Mu everyday life from the 20th century on. So we deal with a very private um, uh, subject uh, which has already com complex uh, uh, items for collecting um, and also very recent history. So there are some complex things about making our collection. Uh, first, I will present the museum with a short history and then I will go deeper and explain how we became to our central teams today um, and our collection policy. Uh, this is a view of our uh, entrance in the museum. Um, of course, as a museum which already a large history, we have a collection, we have a, a huge collection with a lot of objects. The museum was founded in the 1920s by committed volunteers and they wanted to collect the changing daily life. And even then in the 20s, the focus was already the private, um, private life, everyday life and the family. Uh, but they didn't call it like that. It was in the folklore tradition they collected it. Um, they mainly collected a lot of things. There was a focus of collecting a lot and with a widely Focus. So they didn't really had a, um, a, a narrow view of uh, collecting, which was typical at that time. But this collection is still a treasure for us. Um, obviously, they collected a lot of objects, which I show some of these. In the meantime, of course, we have already a huge collection of audiovisual materials, uh, film, photo, photographs, sounds. Here we have some um, stills, uh, uh, film stills from our uh, huge family, a home, a home movies collection. Uh, we have a home movie collection about more than 300 hours in the meantime. Um, and we have also a huge collection of sounds. And the, the museum already from its start, we have a very particip participatory way of collecting. Um, also with the home movies, we, we really asked home movies to the audience, to the public. Um, with the sounds, we had a Rather difficult, a rather different uh, way of collecting. For instance, we, we went on the road to collect sounds, but also the sounds of our materials. For, for example, the, um, the, 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 the toys in our collection or the coffee mills and so on, we, call, we, we registered the sound and now this is part of our collection. The collection of everyday life um, is a is in the meantime a rich source of, uh, of history writing. Uh, it's a testimony of the changing daily life. Uh, but the museum existed already since the 20s, but in 2017-18, we really needed a new mission statement. We really needed to reorient the, 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 the museum and especially the focus on how to deal with uh, the actual everyday life and how to deal with diversity has to be higher on the agenda. And therefore, we wanted to rewrite a mission statement, a vision for the museum, but um, in accordance to the participatory tradition of the museum, we want to also have the, 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 the voice of the public in our new orientation from the museum. So we asked the public uh, some questions, and these questions were mainly, um, which tradition, ritual, or habit do you want to cherish? Uh, or which one would you rather see to disappear? Um, and the answers, the, the answers on these questions were very um, inspiring for the new mission statement, but actually for the whole work in the museum, also for the collection policy, for the um, public uh, activities, 
uh, for the new exhibition, we have a, always a, a contemporary exhibition, but still but we have also a main exhibition, which uh, lasts a few years, but can change within these years. Um, and actually, the answers on these questions really um, uh, emphasizes the new narrative from the collection policy and the new um, main exhibition. Uh, I have some examples here, but uh, unfortunately they're in Dutch, uh, but they're very private, they're very personal, and um, sometimes they really are testimony of a very religious vision, but very diverse religions, um, uh, visions. But uh, what was very striking to me, what was very, um, um, what was, which, which, was, which was very striking was the very personal thing and the focus on family, friends and um, dining together. Being on the table together was very, um, was, was something that was on the half of the answers. Um, and then we really uh, inspired the, the collection policy um, in this way and we um, made our new main exhibition inspired by this narrative. Um, the rituals, traditions, uh, and habits uh, are central in our main, um, main exhibition. Uh, excuse me. The new main exhibition tells the story of the annual calendar. And this annual calendar was something that was regularly coming back in the answers the public gave us. Uh, here we have a room about the 1st of January, the first um, New Year's Day. Um, and we show here all things, uh, objects, but also sounds and uh, home movies, um, uh, stories about rituals typical for that day. Um, it is immediately clear that the House of Alain is on the crossroad between tangible and intangible heritage. But actually the things you see here are um, testimonies of intangible heritage. Um, and the calendar, uh, already the words, ritual, tradition, habits, already say this thing. Uh, actually, we collect, um, we document this, the traditions, rituals and uh, habits, um, and our collection is actually a documenting of the intangible heritage. Um, so this is clearly in the room of the 1st of January, but we have, for instance, also a room about um, fortune and misfortune, uh, which contains also things about religion. Um, and for instance, um, the answers of the public inspired for this um, for this narrative, but our in previous uh, in a previous way many of these things we see in this room were collected as religious objects. But in this way, the museum was focused on one local focus on on, on religious. But of course, nowadays there's a broader view, and we needed to capture that broader view and the um, the focus on rituals, traditions, and habits. Um, the focus on the uh, annual calendar made this very easy for us to do so. Um, another room, for instance, is about uh, the giving birth. Um, the narrative is the, of the main exhibition is the annual calendar, but in the meantime, uh, a visitor experienced the circle of life. For instance, the 2nd of, of February is uh, an important day um, in the Catholic uh, agenda, uh, but it's also a day that universal, uh, that the team, the Catholic uh, team about that day is actually about giving birth. And that's of course a universal team, even within the religious point of view or not, it is a universal team. Um, so traditions, rituals and habits are central, uh, but I have to emphasize the focus um, is traditions, Traditions are changed. So we don't focus on one uh, specific um, uh, kind of view about this tradition, but tra traditions and change. The thematic rooms contains objects, stories, uh, film, photos from the, 20, from the whole 20th centuries till today. Uh, and it's an important objective is to, to encourage uh, intergenerational dialogue. If you visit a museum with peers or with people from another um, generation, you will have a total different uh, visit. Uh, but this we also explore in our collection management. Um, the same narrative we use also in the public activities. Um, Diesel, for instance, is also about the public activity about the 2nd of February, the room about giving birth. This is also a, a festivity about light, about new, new life. Um, so we we organize uh, workshops uh, and so on 
about that team. But in the meantime, we, um, we um, organize also workshops for kids, for instance. This is a, 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 um, a something for at that time. The, um, a guide is giving information in the specific room about the team. And we also ask people, please come with um, photos, with stories about this, um, uh, this holiday, about this uh, team. Uh, to our collection. Um, and it's all about, it's, it's not all about um, the, the, the material thing, but it's more important, it's about our documentary way of collecting. Uh, we do not only collect the picture, we do not only collect the object, but actually we, we write a story of the person who tells, who, who comes to us and tells us, we ask, do you have do you know still which songs you are uh, singing? Do you, do you have pictures of it? Do you have a home movie? And actually the, 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 the complete thing about this is for us very important. Um, focus is on documentary uh, collecting, but a lot of attention is um, needed to be to, 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 to the story and to the emotions involved. Because perhaps this is the most important core. Uh, all these traditions, rituals, and and uh, habits evoke emotions, uh, loving and cheerful, but uh, also pain or loss. Um, the House of Alain is a museum that not only evokes emotions by its uh, presentation, but uh, emotions in themselves are a central theme. Um, for instance, here we are in the room about uh, marriage and love. Um, but for instance, here, this is a bride on her um, uh, day of marriage who visits the museum with her family. Um, and you can't imagine that uh, when she's there with her mother-in-law, her own mother, the stories that uh, pops up with, within the family are very important. And for us in, di in, in, in this time, actually this is a public activity for, um, uh, this is with the guide and so on. But for us, it's important that there is um, a collection manager involved in this. So he can ask the people, you were talking about this or you, you, you were talking about another tradition in the family, Please, do you have uh, some uh, testimonies about this that we can collect in a museum, uh, neither tangible or intangible, a story or an object? Um, people come to the museum in, at important moments of in their life. Um, so the museum is about these. Um, the, the museum is about these important moments of life. But the people come also in, the, in, in these days. Um, so that's a very very um, emotional thing in the museum. Um, and when you visit a museum in your life, when you just gave birth to a child or just when you are just married like this, uh, the, the woman in this picture, or you're just heartbroken or divorced, you will have a totally different um, uh, museum visit. But for us, it's also the possibility to how to deal with this in collection management. Um, and we, that, that, that's for us an, 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 a very important thing to how to deal with emotions in collection uh, management. Um, I gave just two, um, two examples, marriage and uh, the, 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 the 2nd of February, the holiday on, on, on that day. Uh, but these two teams are actually two teams uh, which we already um, collect for a long time in the museum. Uh, that are traditional uh, teams actually for the museum. We look at them with a the, with the broadened point of view. But of course, the the the... the calendar gives us also the possibility to create new traditions and so on in our collection management. For instance, um, last year, it's, uh, in November, we, uh, um, we gave a room to the, uh, to the Mexican, uh, to the Mexican um, um, uh, community here in uh, Ghent for, for, to organize their Dia de, la, de los Muertos. Um, so they made some workshops in, the, in this room. They had a, a, a festival, a real festival. They had a, a presentation of, a, they created an altar, a, a traditional altar. But at that time, we could ask to, those, to, 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 to them, please, can we add some pictures about this tradition, how, you, how, you, um, uh, how it's celebrated in here in Ghent, here in Flanders, um, to add to this to our collection, 
because our collection about um, commemorating uh, the people who died, the, 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 the first and second in, of November, the, tra the tra traditional days about mourning, are still a very Catholic point of view in our collection, but we want to broaden them. But by working together with this community, by giving them space in the museum, and by um, uh, registrate this, um, this, this, this tradition in the museum and to ask them for other pictures, stories, home movies and so on, we can enrich our collection in this way. Um, so this, is, uh, this was a picture of uh, this, um, this in the museum. This is another picture. People were, uh, this is really the Mexican society of Ghent who was um, um, yeah, taking place in the museum. Um, and um, at that time, we also um, make research about these traditions and uh, we, pub we publish about them on our website. For instance, here we have a story about Halloween, which is also in this in these days, but another point of view, of course. But uh, for instance, on about Halloween, we have less, we don't have much in our collection because it's a very recent um, festivity in, um, in uh, Flanders and there has to be the, the, the heritage reflex actually. So we have to, we do call, call for action to the public, but we have to also be proactive and already um, put some um, information on our website or to organize some uh, public festivities and so on in our uh, museum so we can make the 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 the, the, the um, so we can integrate these themes in our collection so we can make our collection more diverse because um, we have the tradition to work on a very participatory way but to realize um, diversity in that way is not that easy so we really want to by the, by the narrative in our museum, by the public uh, activities in our museum, we want to uh, emphasize that this is also part of our, muse of our museum point of view. And so it, it has to take place in our uh, collection management. Um, of course, in the crisis of uh, nowadays, the Corona crisis, daily life, the, the changes in daily life became, um, news became uh, headlines of the news actually um and normally it's a very um it's, it's changes in daily life doesn't happen that fast but now it goes very fast um and also we we did also call calls for um for collecting uh but we we chose the teams that on a on a very universal way for instance here we have um the call for action for about birthday how do we celebrate birthday uh, and we, we wanted to focus on um uh, on the corona crisis but actually we do uh, collect all kind of uh, recent birthday birthday um uh, parties because our collection we we, we pronounce we, we collect from the 20th century on, but actually materials from the 90s and then after 2000 is very difficult. Uh, people don't bring that, that, that uh, pictures of, uh, or um, to the museum, but we realize uh, that from, to, from uh, the recent years, people won't bring easily that material because it's a more digital, um, uh, Johanna Kroll from Poland already mentioned it, the, the digital way of collecting becomes a very important uh, thing. Um, and now we are actually with this new kind of uh, calls. We really focus on that, um, for instance, Instagram pictures, because our normal pictures are the, the family albums. But of course, now a family album is changed in an in Instagram um, album. Now we started to collect these also. Um, and um, for instance, around the, about the birthday, uh, parties we had the first um, thing now and it was already um, a very um, impressive to see how people deal with this um, with this call because there is it's not so evident for people to send their pictures from Facebook from Instagram to the museum uh, there has to be a heritage reflex about this um, we have a very participatory way of working. Here is, we had some uh, examples, but because we are run of time, I will uh, don't focus then. But I really want to focus on uh, our mission statement. So this is our mission statement that we made, uh, of course, with the, mission, with the museum staff, but it was really inspired by asking the public um, how 
they looked to the to the collection management and how it became the narrative of the annual calendar and the rituals of uh, the important uh, moments of life. Uh, and this is now our mission statement for the next years. The House of Alain collects, researches, and shares memories. Uh, about focus on the, the day uh, on the word memories uh, because collection it doesn't fit all for us because if we want also to collect stories and so on and memories evokes also those those emotionals already mentioned um, and we really want to emphasize the, the importance of, the, of these emotions in our collection management also strange and familiar past and present as a museum for everyone together we give meaning to what touches and connects people and this is really our uh, uh, compass we use this for uh, our collection man management nowadays. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Els, for, for your very interesting presentation. And there are some questions arising already. And uh, of course, about the current days and current everyday life. And now I have to pass on the floor to our next speaker who will um, end up our session. It's Mina Sar Sarantala Weiss uh, from Finland, uh, head of research in Helsinki City Museum. Please, uh, Mina. Yes, uh, he hello dear colleagues. Do you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, great. And do you see my PowerPoint as well? No? No, not yet. No. Not yet. Try again. Okay, great. And then full screen. Is it okay now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, uh, what I am going to do today is to give you a few examples on how the significance analysis tool can be used in the communication between a museum and its public and community. Uh, a good question is, of course, whether a museum like Helsinki City Museum in a capital city with half a million inhabitants can claim to be a com community museum, but that is in any case something we are striving for. We believe that without a community, there is no museum and we think that the significance analysis tool is a quite good means of communication actually. Uh, the method is certainly familiar to many of you, but I will recap it here briefly. Uh, it is a method for determining the significance, meanings and museum value of museum objects and collections. Uh, it was first developed by the Australian Collections Council some 20 years ago and the method has since been updated and similar tools for determining the value of collections and to classify them have also been developed in for instance Netherlands, Nor Norway and also in Finland. Um, the collecting and documenting uh, value classification and significance analysis merge in many ways. We often record the meanings of objects when we add something into collections, or at least we should. I think that most museums emphasize the meaning aspect nowadays very much. Um, significance analysis is something, in turn something that you can use to classify the objects. And value classification, again, is one of the ways in which we can keep our collections dynamic. Uh, it can be used to direct the, to, to use the collection, to, to, to direct the use of collections, the resources for collections work, for collections management and so on. Uh, reflection on meaning and value can also lead to the deaccession of an object. Uh, the manuals do describe a process, uh, here one version of them, how the process should proceed in an ideal case. It begins with a selection of a suitable or topical object and ends with a significance statement, here with green, uh, and perhaps also 
uh, with practical recommendations and instructions to management and further actions in the museum. Uh, on the basis of the statement, it is possible to make decisions on the object's position in the collections and, for example, its exhibition use. Uh, we finished in our museum only last week the analysis of two old cars that we decided to remove from the collections on the basis of a significance statement. Uh, the object can, of course, be anything. It must not be tangible. It can also be intangible. It could be a sound, a landscape, or some built heritage. With the same tool, you can both exercise good collection management or find arguments in discussions about, for instance, memorials and monuments. Black Lives Matter, I think, is very much about the significance. Uh, all the concepts of significance and value assessment list up criteria that should be considered during the analysis and interpretation. These seven points of view are used in the Finnish version. They are all very relevant and describe an important aspect of the museum or heritage value of an object. I am not going to read them to you, but you are very welcome to comment them in the Q&A field if you want to. As Julia Kupina said yesterday, we collect relationships in first place, not objects. And um, I think that significance analysis, analysis makes these relationships visible with the help of these variables or some, some else. As such, the method produces excellent results that really go in depth with the object. But nat naturally, it takes a lot of working time. So one must consider very carefully what is chosen as target. What are the key objects in the collection that really deserve this kind of very detailed review? The cars I mentioned in our collection were in a very bad condition and took a lot of space in storage. Uh, we wanted, therefore, to find out if they really were significant for the collection and thus worth the resources invested in them. It turned out that their Helsinki connection and the bound to a community was very thin. Their usability was also poor because of their very big condition. And it was very easy for us to make a an, an accession decision. But without the analysis, uh, the decision would have been much uh, more difficult to make. Uh, one, in my opinion, very lovely example from my museum is a jeans store sales sign from the 1980s. Uh, this analysis was done as part of university studies in museology, and the end result has therefore been an excellent written significance essay. The students sought the wealth of information, as you can see here on the mind map, mind map about the early stages of the business and interviewed its former marketing director. Uh, in addition, they searched for a group of people who had been teens in the 1980s and interviewed them about their genes memories. The end result is a very rich description of the denim relationships of young people and the purchase of fashion clothes in the 80s. The analysis raised the importance of this particular sales sign in our collections quite significantly. The students of museology have also otherwise been an excellent partner in analysis issues, and I also find the method a good tool for education in heritology, as it opens up a wide range of perspectives on cultural heritage. Um, the, tool was originally intended for professional use. However, we also believe that the method has great potential for audience work because it so strongly emphasizes experiences, feelings, and meanings to the community. Very important is that it is also fun to work with the tool. We have witnessed a lot of enthusiasm, excitement, empowerment, and laughter. We have done a few experiments at our museum from this very perspective and tried to transform this quiet professional or even academic concept into a participatory activity. On the plus side is that the museum gets closer contact with the communities and they again gain a greater understanding of cultural heritage and collection work. 
The method helps in bridging the gap between museums and the audiences and communities. A light minus in working with communities is that you don't necessarily get the finished statements with recommendations for collections management, but this is something for us professionals to solve case by case. Uh, my aim today was to tell it to you about a process we have started with a group of young people uh, who, as a hobby, explore museums from an accessibility point of view. Uh, we feel very much honored that they want to work with us, but unfortunately, uh, the um, analysis I wanted to present here today is not ready yet. We did not receive it in time, and this is something I guess you all know easily happens in community work. Schedule is not the main focus of the participants always. And uh, therefore, I will instead tell you about a rather big tram collection pro process we had in our museum. Uh, public transportation is one of the nationwide collection responsibilities of the city museum. We have a system with nationwide collection responsibilities in Finland. Uh, we have had 17 trams in our collection, 17, but no underground carriage and the underground is something that we have had in Helsinki since the 1980s and it should be an inter important part of, of, of our collections. So we needed to de-access two trams to make space for accession of the underground carriage. Um, the trams are very dear for the tram enthusiasts in Helsinki. Uh, and they are represented by a very active association, the Tramway Society. Uh, we were afraid that the deaccession of trams would result in a severe emotional storm and lots of negative publicity. Uh, we thus decided to test the significance method to get the approval of the community in the, from, from the Tramway Society. Uh, the analysis was carried out in two workshops where the analysis tool shared as a starting point for assessment and discussion. A representative for the city transport department participated also, as well as the owner for an enterprise that offers trips on historic trams. To begin with, the atmosphere was just as emotional and slightly defensive as we had expected. Uh, however, as we got a guided discussion toward more analytical perspectives on significance, the discussion deepened and became more relaxed. Uh, we as museum professionals also learned a lot. Considering each tram individually, all the 17, showed in objective terms that there was overlap in the collection and that not all trams did fulfill the criterion of authenticity or representativeness. The ICOM code of ethics requires full understanding of the significance of an object before the accessioning. And it would not have been met without this discussion. Uh, as I mentioned before, one dimension of the significance analysis is to produce recommendations and instructions for the management of the objects. Uh, in this particular case, the management point of view was the very starting point for the whole procedure and did also affect the choice of participants. The careful planning and preparations gave also a good result. It was in fact even better than we expected. In the end, we ended up removing from the collection not two as we intended, but six wagons. Uh, the, the decision was very much influenced uh, by the fact that meaningful further use was found for the trams to be removed in, co in cooperation with the participants in the analysis. It was very important to choose the uh, right partners to the discussion. A couple of wagons have later been transferred to event production companies and will remain in the street scene. And some of them are used as spare parts in the enterprise. So we had not to destroy the wagons but they got a new life outside the museum. Uh, my second example is the first object added to the collections of our museum. 
Uh, it is the uniform of the city's cavalry unit, which was recorded by the city council as early as 1787, more than 100 years before the city museum was even established. It is one of the very few textiles we have in the collection from the time Finland was a part of Sweden, and it uh, also carries with it the history of the many wars between Sweden and Russia, during which Helsinki often served as an important bridgehead. It is, the uniform is therefore a key object in the history of the collections and very relevant also for the history of the city. I, I find this particular object very compelling from significance analysis point of view. It is the most classic museum object in terms of age and history, but on the same time an object that might have totally lost its meaning if you don't relate to its story. Uh, we have started to work with it with our friend of the museum association. But I would also like to hear what the school class thinks, for example. The fact is that the friends of the museum represent traditional heritage enthusiasts. But after all, a vast majority of the people of Helsinki today is completely different. Uh, I would uh, like to leave you with this last photo and a question, uh, what connection would she find to the uniform? Uh, what kind of stories and objects would she find significant? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mina, with this very interesting and very important question about diverse communities living in the cities nowadays and how to bring, how to bond, how to link them to the objects which we have in the museums, especially in old museums reflecting the history of the big towns and big uh, history of the, of, of the continent. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left and we have only one question uh, still on our questions and answers. Uh, part so please uh, find time to, to put your questions on and it's question to Leon and Vera about what's the most successful strategy in bringing the young people to this process of remembering of the past and all of you have told about this um, importance of working not only with the past but also with nowadays with the present and especially with the future and how to make your collections important to the future generations, not only to our contemporaries. So please lean and Vera, if um, you have your answer right now, please do very briefly. If not, there's a still room to, to write an answer by internet. Um, Vera, um, um, Kosha was also asking what is your function as curator? Yes, and what's collection? your function? And that will and be think my next question. To start with that. Yes. Yes, please. The, the, the first question of how you, uh, what the best strategy is for, for including young people, I think that is the million dollar question. I think everyone's <laughs> looking for the answer for that. Question. But there are ways. Uh, as far as the uh, second uh, question is concerned, um, I, th I think the uh, curator connection um, is, is, as the word says, a kind of a go between, uh, between. Um, uh, the, the collection of a museum, the, um, the organization uh, uh, a museum also is. Um, I think it is um, a kind of manager of peoples and communities and seeing opportunities of how to connect uh, collections uh, with uh, present day um, traditions or, or um, everyday life. Um, you have to talk and to meet uh, a lot of people. I like that very much. Um, you have to convince uh, people um, that they are uh, the uh, co-owner. That's, that's what I explained uh, earlier. Um, not only, it's not only a matter of uh, convincing and inviting and um, 
um, people to your project, I think you have to convince your own colleagues also sometimes um, uh, in order to make the step from the object uh, focused collection to uh, uh, where these objects came from and in what form uh, similar objects are used uh, today. So it's a bridge uh, function, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, a go-between uh, function. I don't know if this is an answer to the question. Um, uh, this is, uh, this is a, a realized part of the team of curators and um, for this exhibition um, um, I'm more curator for um, object selection let's say and, and, and uh, and uh, um, we, we, we really are too curated because we, we need this connection between objects and people. So it's, it's really important. And, um, and so um, uh, Vera is as a, as a, 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 a most important function, of course, all the curators and in every exhibition, there is this uh, uh, ambition to connect with, uh, with contemporary society very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. And there's another question to everyone. Um, it's from um, Efrat Haberman. Uh, if um, any one of the speakers have written a collection planning document, we've heard about collection strategy and new vision of, of the museum collection. So could you please comment on that? Mm, I can. Yep. Uh, so at least our museum, we have had a collection policy since 2002, and we have just um, finished a new update uh, that will also be translated into English and hopefully be published on our website before Christmas. Mm -hmm. You are very welcome to read it and comment it. Good. I can also add the same. Well, we, we eventually, uh, this year we finished uh, almost three years discussion over policy collection policy at Pauline Museum and uh, only after the some 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 now we need to we need to go to some procedures in our museum and accept the policy but afterwards uh, we will uh, also publish our policy a shortened version on the website so it will be accessible for everyone thank you and it might be good uh, for Comco to make a uh sort of an article on this and, and to ask people share your collection plans here. I want um, to add uh, also something. Uh, it's a busy year for collection managers because we are also rewriting our collection um, um, strategy and planning. Um, and we actually we had to be, we, we would have liked to done it last year, but uh, we were for three years in um, moving our object collection. It was a very huge uh, process, uh, but moving that uh, object collection has also made possible uh, to have these new visions we had. And um, now we are writing them down and it's, uh, I hope also it will work still uh, cr before Christmas and uh, be published on our website afterwards. Thank you, but when you're talking about writing down this, uh, uh, documents like uh, collection policy and collection management policy or strategy. Um, do you include also not 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 just the criteria for selection, but also methods of collecting? Because you've mentioned all of you, you've mentioned not only donors but also various kinds of uh, new ways of collecting, building new connections and partnerships. And how do you describe these new methods of collection? in your documents? Uh, we at least in Helsinki describe them very briefly. It could be more thorough, thorough. And also it was finished in May. Today already I feel it's a bit outdated because we should put much more emphasis on the digital me methods. We have already at least made some tests uh, but we should write it down. I think the di digital strategy is the next big to tool for us to prepare. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if I may add, at our museum, Pauline Museum, we decided to prepare a policy which would be a joint policy for uh, material objects, digital collection and the library. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we wanted to have this broad uh, view on what we have in our uh, museum. And if it comes to methods, I think definitely there is something important. I, I, I think in Belgium, Belgium colleagues uh, mentioned this opposition of active and passive collect collecting. Mm -hmm. So definitely uh, at our museum, we, we are going to make a, a switch from rather being passive and accepting everything. I mean, of, of course, being active in a dialogue with donors, but now we are more aware of what we want to have in the future. So we were able to set some priorities for the next 10 years and be active, for instance, uh, not only accepting donations, but also actively buying things or uh, preparing a documentation project, research projects, field projects, if it comes to digital collection, for instance, and documenting Jewish heritage in situ. So, yes. Definitely, we have methods in this document. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. in, in well, our project analysis is still limited, and I think we have much work to do in, uh, with regard to describing uh, uh, these new collection methods we are doing, but not really uh, describing or not really. Maybe we, we, we need still more strategy, for instance, for um, active contemporary collecting. We did uh, a Corona collecting project. And now we are going to evaluate this to, to learn from that. But we, we, we are really building up experience. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. In the house of Alain, we, uh, we have uh, described four kinds of methods of collecting. Uh, the participatory way, the, um, the proactive way, because um, connect people of communities themselves and proactive collector materials them, but also co-creative and um, making collection ourselves, sending a, photo a photographer or so on, on, really on the road. But um, we have already a di digital uh, strategy, but this focuses on um, sharing our collection. So the other part has to be written, rewritten actually. Uh, but in our collection planning, we really want to make time for uh, doing research how to collect the um, nowadays, a heritage of nowadays, because, we, for instance, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter um, uh, movement has um, been mentioned, but also we had the climate um, marches in uh, France. And then at that moment, I was really wondering, does someone collect these things? But you can't, um, you can't uh, um, be in uh, connecting with the, 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 the um, at that time, you can't, ask the people for collecting these things because when they knew they would make maybe they, uh, their slogans as well in a different way than they would when there's no museum involved. So you don't want to uh, interfere in this, um, in, the, in this strategy. But actually, um, one Sunday evening, I, I, I really had to, 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 I wanted to collect these materials. Uh, but you can't, we have really to do research on this. How do we deal with this? Uh, do we have to all to, who, who does collect this? Does it, is it enough to collect only the, the digital images or uh, where do we, where, but do we collect digital, but do, where, what kind of uh, physical things do we uh, collect and so on? So we really need more research about these things. And I want to take, um, we want really, want, in our collection planning, there's really mentioned we have to take time for doing this research because as Lynn mentioned we are all doing very busy projects and there's the, the agenda who is ruling and um, so but we have to take time to think about these things. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I fear that we will have to close this session in a minute and I would like to say very very great thanks. Thank you to all the speakers and to all those who've been listening and asking questions. And I think you've raised very important uh, topics, especially about new competences of the professionals working and building new collections in new circumstances for, for the museums now and for the museums in the future. And can I please remind you that if you still have any questions, please write them and you will receive your answers via internet. And Daniela, will you say a few words about the, the next things? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for this great session and great ideas. And Lane, yes, we should definitely with Conco do something about all these new ways and how can we 
even if it's just in working documents, start to collect all these ways that, are, that we are testing. Um, I think uh, sessions like these are in, in essential to, to learn also from each other and to, to bring us further in, in developing, collecting development. Um, so we really have to round up because there's the last session of the day is just around the corner. Um, I hope you really enjoyed this session. Uh, as Olga said, uh, if you still have questions, I saw Micah, you had a question for Mina. I just shared it with Mina, so I hope maybe there's still time to answer that. Um, if you still have questions or if you think of questions later, please write them to comcall.secretary at gmail.com and refer to which speaker you have the question and we will make sure that they will end up at the right end. Um, thank you so much, Olga, for, um, for moderating this session. Um, and I hope to see you in our final session today on digital collections mm -hmm. uh, and digital collection mobility. Yeah. So hope to see you in 20 minutes. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a good session.